<laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> this is so nice to be here with you guys. Um, I, I don't want to be that mid-morning lull talk where you're all like, wah, wah. <laughs> so we're actually going to keep this pretty interactive. If at any point this morning you just are like, wait a second, expand on that, I want to invite you to raise your hand and we can just interact this morning too because I want to be accessible to you um, with my own journey and as questions arise. Now, Rachel said, you know, I want you to marvel at this woman and I just kind of was like, ugh, Rachel. <laughs> Because truly, I'm in awe of every one of you sitting in front of me, as you should also be in awe of every woman around you, and you should be in awe of the woman in the mirror. Because truly, no part of any human being that God created was a mistake. There's nothing about you that is wrong. God created you out of a pure intention of love. He deliberately thought of you at one moment in time, and you were you, unique with your own gifts and strengths. He knew exactly what he intended for you to do, and he is cheering for you every single day that you will become that person. Um, I chose a very intentional shirt today, and if you can see it in the front row, it says, Be You, Set the World on Fire, and it's a beautiful woman right here. Does anyone know which saint this is? St. Catherine of Siena. Catherine of Siena has a very famous quote that I hope, if you don't know it, that at the end of today, it is just inscribed upon your heart. And that quote um, basically says, become the person that God created you to be and you will set the world on fire. For that's what it means truly to be a saint, is to be exactly who God made you uniquely to be. It's not to imitate any other woman in this room. It's not to be like me. It's not to be like sister. It's not to be like anybody else except for who you exactly were created to be. Now, I want to back up a little bit to Sister's talk. And this was not something I had on my schedule to talk about, but as she was talking this morning, I was realizing the depths of the wounding of women in our culture. You see, all of you have grown up in a culture and a society that has been lying to you from day one. From the point you were conceived in your mother's womb, there has been a false expectation a false idea of what you should become as a woman and as a mother, or as whatever, not even a mother, just as a female in our society and in our culture. And there are so many lies that we really want to pause probably and get to the heart of that a little bit before we can move forward into realizing the gifts that you've been given. What Sister touched on there, when we have somebody who's grown up in a, in a, a you know, with the faith and with a deep love for Jesus and has a vocation upon her heart, and she's sharing, you know, her struggles, if somebody like sister is experiencing those struggles, then surely every one of us has had those moments where I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. That's often where it starts, like I'm not as good at this as her. And if we get beyond that lie, if we can say, okay, well I have a gift, I have a talent, then the enemy attacks us with his next lie, his next approach is, who do you think you are? So even once we get beyond the I'm not enough and we can say I have these gifts, we then have to deal with this, who do I think I am? As women, I think in our culture, we're especially vulnerable to that attack and that lie. And I can tell you in my own personal life, that's definitely been one that has held me up and has held me back. Uh, and it's almost, honestly, it's almost prevented me from doing the work that I do with Guiding Star, with opening up women's health care clinics, with speaking nationally, with writing a book, with doing these things. It's this subconscious, who do you think you are? That whisper that comes at you, even when you've done the hard work, even when you've learned what your gifts are, even when you've had God light your heart on fire for something, you might set it down still if you don't know exactly who you are. I taught a course this fall to a group of women. It was <laughs> kind of a fun uh, experiment, I guess. Uh, you see all these online courses that are popping up everywhere. Have you guys seen them? You sign up and you do this online module course, and I was like, I'm going to try that. And I did, and I actually really loved it, and I really want to do it again. But the course was called Finding Your Authentic Identity, and it was based upon that quote from St. Catherine of Siena, become who you're meant to be and you'll set the world on fire. And I had 12 uh, amazing women who signed up to be guinea pigs <laughs> and do this four-week course with me. Um, 
And as we went through that course, it was just heartbreaking and revealing how often we hold ourselves back, how often we fail to step into our God-given call and our God-given mission because we fail to recognize that unless I know who I am, well, truly, I cannot know who I am unless I know whose I am. If your mission, if your identity, if every part of you does not rest firmly in the fact that you were created as a conscious thought of the creator of the universe and that your existence and your every breath on this planet would cease if he ceased to think about you for even a second, if you don't have that deep understanding that God never stops thinking about you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the breaths that you take. He knows every single piece about you. And if he ever forgot for a second, you'd be gone. Having that deep realization that you have purpose, you have meaning, you have something that you were uniquely created for, and that if you don't do it, no one ever will because no one else has the exact combination of your experiences, your place in time, your background, your relationships, your wounds. No one can do what you were uniquely created to do. Let that just sit for a second with you. This isn't just about finding something we enjoy doing. This isn't just finding your hobby. What will make me feel happy and what will give me purpose? This is literally being part of God's plan for salvation for humanity, for your spouse, for your children, for your friends, your family, your coworkers, the people around you. You are meant to pour out. You are meant to be filled with the knowledge of who God created you to be so that you can pour out upon our culture healing and joy and beauty and goodness. That's what you were made for. And as women, you were made in an especially unique way to do it as a woman. So that's where I get really excited. That's my background with uh, Theology of the Body and with campus ministry and with women's health care. And we can get more into that. But after Sister gave that talk this morning, I thought, there's something really deep there that we've got to make sure that is settled strongly upon our hearts. You are not a mistake. Your life is not a mistake. Even if it's not going to, along with the plans that you, know, you thought it was supposed to be, even if you've lost control over some part of the grand scheme of what you imagined your identity to be, God knows who you are. And he's, it's never too late. If there's a deep stirring, a discontent, if you are feeling that something is not on the right path, you're here today. You've been called here today to be reminded of who you are. You've been called here today to have us speak truth into you, to have us remind you he has something for you to do. Listen. Okay, that was all a tangent. So, now we're gonna start. So my, um, my background was not in, uh, Gosh, what do you call what I do? <laughs> Social architecture? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what I do exactly. I think that is actually what I'm doing. I think what I'm doing is working to build a culture of life through the vehicle of women's health care. But I didn't have any idea that those were my gifts as a child. I didn't have any idea that that's what God was going to ask of me as a child. I knew that I liked teaching, and I knew that I liked talking, and I loved to read. And I often had periods of time where I'd wander off with a book, you know. I grew up on a dairy farm in central Minnesota. So this is wonderful to be in my area. Um, I actually graduated high school from Staples. So not that terribly far off the road. And there's some people here from Little Falls. I was like, you're like our arch nemesis. <laughs> like, it's kind of fun to actually be around the area where people... Um, understand the life that I grew up in because I grew up on a small dairy farm surrounded by nature had lots of cats lots of dogs I had my own horse I got a horse when I was 12 for my birthday uh, not because we were rich in fact we were dirt poor I think the neighbor farm needed to get rid of the horse <laughs> and we got a horse but it felt very glamorous to say I got a horse for my 12th birthday 
I had a deep appreciation and love for nature as a child. I was drawn to it always. I spent a lot of time outside. That is something that I come back to now as an adult to help me ground myself when I feel confused or I feel busy or I feel harried. I think back to that child that I was. I think back to that little girl on the farm who loved the animals, who loved the sunsets, who loved riding horse through the alfalfa fields in the summer. That is me. That's who I am deep down in that core. That's when I can remember being most in communion with God, being most certain of who God was in my life and who I was meant to be. I'm going to invite you today to kind of start thinking about that even throughout my talk. Try to go back in your mind just a little bit if you can. If there's moments that you can remember that little girl, that peaceful place of I'm happy, I'm content, I'm certain of the world um, because she gets lost in this culture. I started by saying you all have been born into a time and place where your culture and your world is lying to you. You're going to be surrounded by lies from a very young age. I have three daughters. Um, I also have four sons, but I have three daughters. I do, I know I've got seven kids, isn't that nuts? <laughs> I didn't plan that either. <laughs> I was like, wow. Um, but God's good all the time. <laughs> my oldest daughter is 13. My second daughter is six, and then my youngest is a two-year-old. And when I take them into the supermarket, or I take them anywhere out in the world, I've become keenly aware of the messages and the lies that they were receiving already. Cosmo magazine, I mean, I can't even say what the headlines say on Cosmo, it's so ridiculous. But even the, even the milder, even the, you know, the more appropriate magazines, there is a very set expectation for what is successful for a woman in our culture. What is beautiful, uh, what is desirable, how you should be, how you should act. And I notice my daughters. I notice them, you know, their eyes looking at it. I notice them taking this in. And I think as their mother, how can I tell them the truth? How can I get across to them that this is not what God has limited you to? Now, some of the things being presented are not in them of themselves bad. You know, Good Housekeeping Magazine, love it. I mean, my mom loved it. We had probably every copy of it for 25 years in her house. <laughs> like she actually kept every copy of it um, because my mom loved that, and that was something that she identified with. I actually never identified with Good Housekeeping. <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't find the greatest joy or uh, sense of my identity in, in keeping my home. <laughs> I wish I did. But I, I don't, and that's not me. Um, and over the years, I've come to accept that my gifts and my charisms are someplace else. That process of discernment has actually been very difficult for me. Um, growing up as, a, as a, a kid in the culture that we have, you know, I'm a, I'm a zenial, technically, an early millennial. I don't know if there's any more zenials in the room, but we're like that five-year gap between when everything was analog and everything was digital. <laughs> We're like the first kids that had a VCR in our home. Um, so there was a pretty big cultural swing that happened in my childhood where all of a sudden cable TV became the norm and MTV and these outside influences were really weighing upon us what it looked like to be successful. And the images of women that we saw were pantsuits and um, career women and uh, if you were going to be respected, you know, you were going to be very successful. And if you had a, an intellectual mind, if you were smart, you shouldn't waste your talent. You should go to college. You should get, you know, a four-year degree, a master's degree, a PhD, because that, those letters behind your name meant something. It meant you did something with your life. That's the world I grew up in. And I think some of you grew up in the same world. I think some of you carry those same insecurities that maybe my voice doesn't matter if I don't have a certificate or a degree on the wall. That's something I've struggled with over the years to know that what I'm saying matters because I've had the experience and I have the expertise of, of life, you know, to back me up. But anyhow, I had that high achieving personality as a high schooler. Um, I did every event possible in the school. I think, um, 
I did three sports all the way through, tennis, basketball, track. I did band, choir, uh, drama club, athletic things. I don't even remember all the things. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, um, Enable. Is that still around? Enable? <laughs> Education Now and Babies Later? <laughs> that was... <laughs> found that name ironic. Enable? <laughs> like, it's like, what are we enabling here? Uh, no, but I was a peer educator. I went into the elementary schools and taught the kids about chastity. I, I mean, I was in the youth group. I was, I did everything because I thought that's what it meant to be successful. I thought I had to have a million things on my resume to get into the right college or to get the right job someplace down, like, like it mattered, you know, that I had, was an enable educator. But I did it. I did all the things. And there was nothing wrong with those things. Achieving and, you know, being really active and doing a lot. There's nothing wrong with that if you're called to it. But what I was doing is I was falsely creating an identity for myself that felt comfortable, that felt that felt safe, that felt respectable. I was hiding my vulnerability behind achievements, behind ribbons, behind success, quite honestly. I was fitting an expectation that others were giving me. Teachers loved me, you know, I was that student that did all the things, coaches uh, tolerated me. <laughs> um, I had all the things though in line. But in the end, you guys, I was exhausted. It was so tiring to keep up with all these things that things like my prayer life and things that had naturally been there as a child, wandering in nature and talking to God, singing Amazing Grace at the top of my lungs in the middle of the field, I didn't do that anymore because I was too busy. <laughs> I was too busy. God gave me a really gentle reminder and wake up call the end of right the summer I graduated high school actually this was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me I got a job as a camp counselor on Big Sandy Lake at Catholic Youth Camp did any of you go to Catholic Youth Camp CYC campers any of you one <laughs> uh, I ended up working there two summers but that first summer when I moved out of my home I moved out three days after I graduated high school and I was able to go someplace else and be someone new. And I think that was one of the greatest gifts our Lord gave me because in that present, in that place, the Blessed Sacrament was present. We had a chapel. We had the beauty of nature surrounding me again. I could spend time out on the lake. I could, you know, wander off into the trees. Um, it was the perfect place for me to reconnect and strip me of all the identifiers that I previously had been using to introduce myself and identify myself. And so at camp that summer, it was probably the most exhausting experience of my life. <laughs> um, it should have prepared me for the rest of my life because every week I had 11 children, you know, from sun up, from sun to sundown, actually all night, you know, for five days straight, you had 11 children under your care, um, going through everything that they go through at camp, you know, homesickness, wetting the bed, all the things. You're like a mom times a million there. But something in me was awakened that had been dormant since my childhood. I started painting, I started like writing, I started singing. All this stuff started coming out of me, even though in my exhaustion, I was so tired every night. I was so tired. I'd put the kids in bed and I'd try to do a rosary with them. I'd pray, try to pray a rosary and they'd all listen. I'd make it like the first joyful. <laughs> I literally would make it to like the beginning of the rosary and fall asleep because <laughs> I was so tired, but it was such a good, pure exhaustion. Um, end of that summer, I went up to college at the University of Minnesota Duluth as a freshman. I came in at this high of camp, but I still didn't know who I was. And so I fell into the exact same old patterns that I had had in high school of defining myself by achievement. And so that first year of college, it's actually funny to look at it. Um, I walked onto the tennis team. I started playing varsity tennis. <laughs> I signed up for student government and was elected to the top of the student government. I was in choir. Uh, I, was in, I did all kinds of ridiculous extra things. 
things that are so specialized that a university, like usually you don't do music classes unless you're a music major. I had no intention of being a music major, but I was taking all these specialized music classes. I don't know, because I thought I should. So throughout the year, I started getting more tired and more tired and more tired. And I was just getting drained. And the Newman Center at UMD at that point was not very active. Um, there was an older priest who was retired living in the home, and it just wasn't feeding my soul. I wasn't getting the faith, really, that I needed. And so I kind of got mad at the church a little bit at that point. I was a little upset. I was like, where's the church? Where's, where's the church when I need it? I'm exhausted right now. I need to be fed. And I was, there wasn't really much there. About March of that year, I was sitting in the cafeteria one night, and I just had this complete exhaustion again overwhelming me. And I had, I guess the only thing you can really call it is like a spiritual awakening. <laughs> Some might call it a breakdown. <laughs> I'm going to say it's a spiritual awakening. But it was that I was near tears. I was so tired. And I had this moment, this, just this awakening of, I can quit. No one had ever given me permission in my life to quit anything. No one had ever said, you don't have to do that. When I gave my permission to quit these things that have been defining me for years. They've been defining me since middle school. You know, I'm a musician. I'm an athlete. I'm these things. When I finally quit, I felt, I, it was like giddy. It was like euphoria. I was in the cafeteria, the dining center at UMD, and this guy that I knew was sitting next to me, and I remember he sat down, and I was like, I can quit. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. <laughs> and his response was actually just really great because he just said, no one ever expected you to do it in the first place. And I realized he's right. No one ever expected me to do that in the first place. I was giving myself a to-do list four miles long and it was preventing me from doing the things I was actually uniquely gifted and created to do. What happened within the next month was that I quit everything and it was amazing. I quit all those extra things, I just went to class. And by the end of my freshman year, I had decided that campus ministry and the Newman Center is where my heart belonged. So. Over the course of the next couple of years, I don't know if any of you really know this background too much, but I came alive in such a way at campus ministry that was similar to the me at camp. It was similar to the camp counselor version of me. I was so excited. I was so happy. It was just this thing that was so natural to me. I just flowed out on campus. I was like finding the students in the dorms and I'm like, come to mass. <laughs> and they were coming. It was so natural to me that I was just good at it. I didn't even have to try. I didn't have to practice being a campus minister. I didn't have to try. It was just who I was. And I found so much joy and so much contentment in it that, and holy boldness. This is one of the things I'm going to say. When you are living truly as who you are, a boldness comes out that you're like, what was that? <laughs> because as a junior in college, I approached the bishop of the Diocese of Duluth, Minnesota, and I very boldly said, the priest that's in the home is retired and he's tired. Move him and let me take over. They had never had a lay campus minister in the diocese. I was getting married that summer. My husband was still an undergraduate. I graduated a year early because, like I said, I'm a massive overachiever, evidently. <laughs> so I graduated in three years. The bishop gave his blessing. My husband and I got married in August of that year. We moved into the Newman house and we spent the first three years of our marriage uh, running campus ministry at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, those of you probably that are familiar with that probably know now its current resident. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, Father Mike and jo my husband Josh and I, um, we were blessed to be the first employees of Father Mike. We were, I was blessed to be his first ever person that he ever oversaw. Um, we overlapped at the Newman House for one year. We had our first baby while living on campus. We were pregnant with our second baby, and then Father Mike moved in and we moved out. So he's been there ever since. We were the last residents there uh, prior to Father Mike. Um, but that was kind of another element of holy boldness. It was us saying, 
you know, to the bishop, we need a young, energetic priest here. Please send us Father Mike. <laughs> and he did. He moved him down from the iron. And that campus ministry program, it's been like just this beautiful thing to see unfold. But when you embrace the gifts that you've been given, when you know who you are because you know whose you are, the fruit is tremendous. You don't even have to do much. Like, it's not even hard. God blesses it in ways that it's just miraculous. It's just miraculous. So how do you discover what those gifts are? How do you know who you are meant to be, who God created you to be? Your childhood is a hint. Those things that you naturally had peace, that you naturally gravitated towards as a child, that's a little bit of an insight into your temperament. But there are some objective tools currently in our culture which I think are helpful. Um, I found a few of them helpful, actually. Um, there's something called the Spiritual Gifts Inventory from the Catherine of Siena Institute. It's called uh, Called and Gifted as a Workshop. Have, how many of you have ever done a Called and Gifted workshop? Okay. And I know at the back table, some of them are actually trained facilitators. So you'll have to ask them more about it. But that was one of my steps on my journey after I left campus ministry because I knew I had these gifts of like evangelization and teaching and like excitement for the church and how does that actually translate outside of anything but campus ministry and youth ministry and in the real world? How do you actually use any of those gifts? Um, but first, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to read you what the gifts are in that spiritual inventory and I just want you to like listen to the gifts and see if any of them immediately resonate with your heart. Um, and these are different than gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are considered charisms. And we can learn more about that a little bit later. But I'm going to read them to you and just see if any of these really, really strike you. So these are considered spiritual gifts. Um, administration. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Celibacy. Craftsmanship. Discernment of spirits. Encouragement. Evangelism. Faith giving, healing, hospitality, intercessory prayer, knowledge, leadership, mercy, missionary, music, pastoring, prophecy, service, teaching, voluntary poverty, wisdom, writing. I had held up certain ones of these as like better than others, kind of based on the world standards and what the world said was a good, I mean, how many, how many magazines are you going to see like, increase your voluntary poverty? <laughs> <laughs> that's not like a headline that you'd see in a newspaper of like, um, you know, that's just not something that's upheld in our current culture. Or, um, how to grow in your celibacy. It's not something you see. However, there's certain things that you see in there like, um, learn to be a better craftsman. You know, um, this musician that is incredibly famous and popular. There's certain spiritual gifts that the, the culture gives a little more attention to and it says are a little more acceptable and are a little easier to, you know, latch on to. And so I was latching on to kind of the spiritual gifts of others that weren't mine. They weren't mine. When I took the inventory, music, which is like the thing I thought was mine, was in my bottom five. <laughs> it's like it was in the it was like one of the worst things. I was not good at it. I mean, actually I was talented at it, which is ironic. Because I wasn't bad at it, but I wasn't called to it. So it's important to really pray through that. You know, typically if you are given a natural talent in something, God wants to use it for his glory. Typically, if you have a natural talent, God's going to use it. So look to your natural gifts. Look to the things that other people around you are always saying, wow, you're really good at that. But do not let them tell you that that's who you are. And I think that was part of my problem. The people in my life had far too much weight. They had far too strong of opinions. And I took them in such a way that it pushed me down the wrong paths. So be really careful about who you surround yourself with. Um, make sure you know who the trusted people are in your life that always tell you the truth. 
They always tell you the truth about who God is. They never are off on who God is. People that you trust to be holy. Because if they knew who God is, they would really tell you who God made you to be. But if they don't know God and they don't know God's purpose and they don't know what God's grand scheme of all of this is, they're going to misdirect you. Be very careful about who you give your ear to. Uh, <laughs> I had a great discussion about this exact point, actually, with my children the other day. <laughs> we were watching Moana, <laughs> which is a great movie, actually, besides all the like gods and goddesses and all the heresy. But other than that, there's, there's some really strong themes in there. There's a scene in the movie Moana where she's on the raft with Maui. And they just had this big failure of a thing. And, and she says, um, he basically says, um, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. Like, you, you, whatever you think you were supposed to do, it's wrong. You did the wrong thing. I don't believe you. I'm out. He takes off. He abandons her. And she's, it's, a, it's like that you know, hero crux of the story of what's she going to do. And in her sadness and in her despair, and having somebody negatively speak to her, having somebody tell her, you're wrong, you don't know who you are, you don't know your mission, you don't know your call, she gives it up. So if you've seen the, the movie, so she's got the heart of Tafiti and she throws it back in the ocean and she's like, I don't, you know, she's going to actually. In her hand, and as she goes to drop it, she can't give it up. There's something about her that's just like, I can't, this is not right. And at that exact moment, her dead grandmother appears, <laughs> which is really wonderful and convenient. <laughs> and she has this conversation with her and she sings this song basically um, do you know who you are do you know who you are and then she starts to say you know oh, and actually, it's so funny my daughter and I were crying when we watched it the other day so I'm like I'm gonna cry but I'm not gonna cry because it's Moana and that's silly <laughs> but she goes through the she starts to say who she is she starts to affirm herself she says I am the daughter of whoever I am from, Mo'anu, whatever island she's from, I don't know the words. But she starts to positively state the truths. This is who I am. This is what I am talented at. This is what makes me unique. And at the end, you know, she says, I am Moana. And she takes her mission and she, goes and she does it. And that moment is so powerful for me because it's this, it's this world lying to us and saying, you're wrong. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You're wrong. It's all falling apart. It's, nothing's working. It's hard. I'm out. I'm not going to stand beside you. I'm not going to support you. This looks crazy. You look crazy. And it's this grandmother, this trusted person who's always known who she is, who's always seen her, who's always identified and known these are your gifts and your talents, that speaks to her in that moment and just gently says, who are you? So Moana will never be the same. If you go back and watch Moana, um, I, use this, I use that sometimes with youth groups a little bit too, is Disney movies. There's some crazy truths tucked into Disney, Disney movies, but I mean, the main point of that is the, uh, the quote from St. Augustine, you know, that the deepest desire of the human heart is to see another and to be seen as we are. You know, St. Augustine identifies that and says, we all just want to be seen for who we are. We all want to be known for what we do and who we are uniquely created to be. So, okay, alongside of the spiritual gifting inventory, I think another helpful tool, at least that I have found in my life a little bit, to help me know that I shouldn't drop my mission, because there's been a lot of points along the way, you guys, where it's been really hard. I mean, there have been days where I'm like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this, God. I don't want to do this anymore. It's really hard. Full transparency, I flew in from Boston last night at 11 p.m. I got back to Brainerd at 11 p.m., and then I drove down here this morning. I, you know, I kissed my kids in their sleep. I left them a note this morning, and then I had to head out. You know, that's hard. I don't like that. That doesn't feel good. And there are days when I'm very tempted to say, Lord, like, it's too much. I'm out. But then he always sends me that one person, that one thing, that one little moment of, I need you here. Like, your children right now are okay. Like, your mom's coming over. They're going to have a great day. They're going to make cookies. They're going to have fun. I'm, I've got them covered. But I need you here right now. And it's that radical openness to the Lord that we all have to pray for every day because it is so easy, guys, to just say, this looks crazy. I, I make people uncomfortable with how unorthodox my life is. 
sometimes in my mom's group at church, I'll see like that raised eyebrow and they're like, you're doing what? <laughs> and I, I, I've come to the point now of run, understanding and recognizing I don't need to justify it. I don't even need to explain it except to say, these are the gifts God gave me. So when I took the uh, gifting inventory, um, all top of my five gifts, I was basically tied for five gifts up top. They were evangelism, ministry, writing. It was all exactly what I'm called to do. There was no housewifery in there, <laughs> which is not evidently what I'm called to do. Um, and that was something that was hard for me too. Like just understanding the expectations of typically the typical Catholic mom, the typical Catholic wife, what we imagine, homeschooling mom, seven kids. I don't homeschool. My kids are in a public school. I'm not your typical Catholic mom in some circles. But that's okay because I'm who God made me to be. That's okay because I'm out there living the gifts that he gave me. It's okay because I'm learning how to open up women's health care centers all around the country that tell women the truth of their body, that give them back their identity. I'm me and I'm not you. And I'm really glad that I was made to do the work I do. And I'm really glad you were made to, the work, to do the work you do. We have to stop comparing. We have to understand that Theodore Roosevelt actually had a great quote on that. Uh, comparison is a thief of joy. If you're feeling unsettled and you don't feel joy when you think about your friendships, think about how you're looking at your friends. Are you comparing yourself? Are you thinking, you know, they're doing it wrong, I'm doing it right, or I'm doing it wrong, they're doing it right. We need to understand that we are not created similar to each other. I mean, we're similar. We're similar. <laughs> we are not created the same as one another. And we're never going to have unity as women, and we're never going to have that authentic joy where we can celebrate one another's accomplishments until we can appreciate who we are first, that we know our own gifts and talents, and then you naturally start to appreciate the gifts and talents in other women. It wasn't until I gave up all those extra things that I could start feeling joy for my friends who were good at those things. In high school, when one of my friends did better than me at something, it was like a personal pain. Like, I felt like I failed. Like, I could not even appreciate, you know, when my best friend, you know, gets named to the national honors something, something. Because I felt like I failed. And that's not okay, guys. That's not okay. We need to be able to celebrate our friends' victories. We need to be able to see what they're doing and say, that's amazing. I'm so proud of you. I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest cheerleader. We all have to be that to one another. We have to pull out one another's gifts. Tell each other the truth. Tell each other the truth about who we are, what we're gifted to do, uh, and really encourage them. Uh, practically speaking, uh, you know, things like Clifton Strengths Finder, I found that to be another really helpful tool for me. If you've never taken a Strengths Finder inventory, I recommend it. It's like 50 bucks, but you get the 34 list of 34 gifts, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, and the piece about that that I actually found the most helpful for me was, yeah, the top five strengths were important, but the bottom five were also important. And sometimes we look at them and we think, well, those are the things I'm really terrible at. I'm so bad at that. But you need to shift that because all that is is that's telling you what you should let somebody else do. Because my bottom strengths happened to me my coworkers' number one strength. And that's good. That's really good because I know I'm not good at that, but I know she's amazing at it. And so I need to let her be fully herself and excel in that area. It's not a threat to who you were or who you were created to be to recognize and acknowledge that someone else was created with different gifts that are not yours. So I find Strengths Finder to be you know, really valuable, uh, really helpful. Um, and it's, it's helped me as a leader tremendously to hire better, uh, to work better with people, uh, to just say, that's not what I can do well, and that's okay. <laughs> you can do that a lot better than I can. It makes me far more relational with people. It makes me um, recognize, this is another piece of this too, just, gosh, I'm telling you all sorts of things. All these things that I've learned over the years, and I'm still learning, I'm still definitely a work in progress. Um, 
We can't find ourselves by ourselves. You can't. You can't just, I mean, yes, prayer with God. The more you know God, the more you're going to know yourself. But he's made us relational beings for a reason. Uh, just like man and woman, for those of you theology of the body buffs out there, our bodies don't make sense by themselves. Like a male body by itself, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Female body by itself, that doesn't make sense. It's only when you put them together that you're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> it's the same thing with our own gifts and talents. We can't really fully understand them until we step back and look at the needs of the whole world and the church and everybody else around us. We find our gifts in relationships and in community with others. You're not an island. Don't go off on this quest by yourself. Find that trusted spiritual director. Find that person in your life that can help reflect back to you who you truly are created to be. How much time do we have, Rachel? You don't know? Okay, 15 minutes. All right, so I, I'm going to actually kind of end on, on one final point here, and then I actually do want to open up for just questions and answers about the actual, like, logistics of my life, because that seems to be something that people want to understand. <laughs> um, so if you do have any questions, we can go into that in a bit. But the final point, you know, that I started with and that I hope you take from this talk, if there's only one line that you take from this talk, um, it's really this concept of that we can't know who we are until we know whose we are. You cannot. So each day, each day that we strive to become more and more ourselves, it really means that you are striving to become more and more the person that God willed into being, that person that he thought of, his conscious act of creative love. When he thought of you in that second, that's what it means to become fully yourself. We grow, we become ourselves the more like God that we become, the more holy we become. We become more merciful, more loving, more sacrificial, more generous, more relational, more surrendered. We give up complete control because we trust that we are loved and held and loved. We become fully ourselves in direct proportion to how united to God we are. Objective tests, yes, like things like Strengths Finder spiritual gifts inventories, increased self-awareness, you know, all those things show us the unique person that we are in relation to everybody else. But honestly, knowing our own qualities you know, pales in comparison to knowing the qualities of God. If we know who our loving creator is, that's ultimately time better spent than any in in inventory. Because if we focus in on ourselves and we just get obsessive about inventories and like these are my gifts and these are my strengths and how am I going to use them, if we lose sight of God the Father above as the creator of me as a unique person, we can actually become very self-centered. So your gifts and your charisms are meant always to be poured out and given away. When you are doing the thing God created you to do, you are naturally creative because that is who God is. God creates. Creativity is the mark that you are becoming who God wants you to be. You're doing something. You're creating. And it might not actually be a physical thing. It might be that you're creating a loving home or atmosphere. Or you're creating assuredness and confidence in others. But you're creating. It might be that you're creating women's centers all over the country, <laughs> but I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think that's a call that everybody has. But whatever it is that you're called to create, that you're called to bring to the world, you need to do it because no one else is going to. All right, that's all I've got for you. <laughs>